Okay, so thank you very much for including me in the program and congratulations to Tim uh, for getting an honorary degree. Uh, in fact, uh, when I was invited, I had, a two, I had a choice between the two papers and uh, just hearing uh, Ramon's talk, I might have made a wrong choice. The other paper I had was actually a dynamical system that generate the endogenous cycles, the business cycle, without disfinanciability. So actually, <laughs> the, it turns out that the, the dynamical system, sometimes a non-differentiable system, is easiest to solve. So that's why that I was actually able to do the two-country version of it to talk about how the trade could cause the synchronization of the business cycle. Uh, but um, but I already made a choice. So, <laughs> and so th this is actually not dynamic. Okay. So if you think the, if you define the macro as a dynamic, this is not macro. But if you think that the, the macro is is an applied general equilibrium, then this belongs. This is a macro model. Okay. So home market effect on pattern trade between the rich and poor countries. So that so here's the motivations. So first of all, that the sectors. Uh, differ widely in their income elasticities. Okay. It's, it's sort of a general uh, angle flow. And there's the empirical evidence that the rich countries uh, tend to be a net exporters in uh, high income elastic sectors, and the poor countries are net exporters in low income elastic sectors. So how are we going to capture this? Well, the standard trade model focus on the supply side determinant of the pattern of the trade. And to focus on the supply side, they try to uh, uh, simplify on the demand side by assuming a homothetic preference. Now, in fact, they usually assume that every kind of consumer has the same homothetic preferences. So there's no notion of different sectors having a different income elasticities. So these standard models that we teach to the, to the undergraduate and most of the time to the graduate students are actually not useful. But just putting uh, no home safety preferences in the standard trade model actually work in the opposite direction because then the rich country, that would make the rich country demand more of the high income elastic, uh, uh, the goods, which makes them an uh, importer in the high income elastic sectors. Okay? And when that, that might work for things like caviar or diamond. Uh, who the location of the production is determined uh, exogenously by the, the, by the nature, but certainly this is working in the opposite direction the, 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 for, the, for the things that we want to explain. And for this reason, the existing general equilibrium model of trade with no homothetic preferences, they all assume that the rich country have a comparative advantage in a high income elastic sectors. For example, the, the, the series of paper by the, uh, using a Ricardian model, the, starting from Flam Helpman, Nancy Stokey, I have a paper like that, and, uh, the, and the field also has, they just make assumptions that in a Ricardian model, the rich country has a competitive advantage in, in high income domestic sectors. Uh, there's a series of paper by Markson, uh, which is a little bit more sophisticated, uh, using a sort of hexa Olin type model. So the you know his paper solo paper back in uh, uh, actually 40 years ago, uh, he argued that uh, the rich countries are capital abundant and therefore export the capital intensive goods, which happens to be uh, high income elastic uh, sectors. And then well, his more recent papers that uh, he argued that. The rich country the skill abundant and therefore export the skill intensive goods, which happens to be uh, high income elastic sectors. Okay? But all these models um, actually implies the rich export high income elastic sectors, despite their demand market in these sectors, uh, their, their domestic markets in these sectors are relatively large. Okay? We take a very different approach here that we try to explain the rich has a, a, a competitive advantage in high income elastic factors because, not despite, the because their domestic market in these sectors are relatively large and, and, and due to the home market effect. So what is the home market effect? Uh, for those who worked in the trade, uh, this is actually a well-known example. So going back to the original sort of Krugman 1980 example in the AER, so he has the following uh, sort of examples. So there are two Dixit Stiglitz monopolist competitive sectors he called the alpha and beta and with some trade cost. Okay? Uh, and then 
There are the one factor of production, that he called it the labor, that can be used for both setting up the companies as well as, as uh, manufacturing the goods. Okay? And there are two countries of equal size, A and B, and they are mirror image to each other in the following sense. So, as, actually, let me use the example. Okay? So, suppose that alpha is a, a the breweries. Okay? Mm -hmm. uh, beta is, is, is a, the brewery produces beers. Okay? And the beta is the wineries that produces wine. Okay? And A is a, country A is a nation of beer lovers with a minority of wine lovers. And country B is a nation of the, uh, the actual wine lovers, but you know, with a minority of beer lovers. And then what happened, in an, in, and, and also they, he assumed that the mirror image assumption in the sense that the share of alpha lovers in A is equal to the share of the beta lovers in, in, in B. So it's, they, are not, they are not same, but they're mirror image to each other. Okay? And then what he has shown is that in autarky, the proportionally large share of the firms and, and the labors are worked in in, 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 in alpha, and, uh, but under trade, the disproportionately large share of the, uh, of the workers and other farms are, are operated in, in the sector A. Okay? And as a result, country A become uh, the next exporter in alpha. So the country, actually, I, 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 let me actually stick with my example. So suppose in a country where the majority of beer lovers the majority of workers worked in the beer industry, okay? And, but when they started trading with uh, the other country, the, no, no, even the more workers started working in the beer industry and, and then actually started exporting beer to, to, to the, to the uh, so you think of it like a Belgium and France, okay? The Belgium is a, a, uh, the country of beer lovers, but with a minority of the wine lovers. And then the, the France is a, the majority of wine lovers, but no, the, but the minority of the beer lovers. Okay? Then what happened is that the Belgium export beers to the minority of beer lovers in France, and the France exports wine to Belgium to sell the minority of the, the wine lovers in the Belgium. Okay? <laughs> So they, and, and furthermore, that this effect is, is magnified uh, as the trade costs get smaller. So the key insight here is that, so there are some scale economies in the most competitive model, but there are some scale economies, but with the presence of some small but positive trade cost, that the structure of the industry adjusts its local demand, okay? And, and, and then, you know, so the, because the Belgian, the majority of beer lovers, the more resources allocated to the beer industry, and then they, started selling, that become their source of a competitive advantage, and they sell it to the, to the farmers. Okay. So there is an also, yes. It's just a scale factor. It's not a question that the, uh, you are better quality in beer because No, 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 no just a scale here, yes, yes. Okay, and then the variety effect. Okay. So that in a Krugman's model, there's no, of course there's a demand differences, play a crucial role uh, across the country. But those, the demand composition difference across the country actually come from an exogenous variation in taste. Okay. Um, and also that actually, the, 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 um, actually given the time, I'm, I'm not, I, mean, I probably shouldn't spend too much time on this. Uh, the mirror image of you know, setup, it actually, it's a greatly you know, simplified the uh, actually the solving the model, but it has some, some the problem. So I decided to actually also so I uh, tried to modify the, the original Krugman model uh, by allowing a demand composition that arises endogenously uh, through the non homothetic preferences. And I also going to drop the mirror image assumptions to, to, uh, to, uh, to actually uh, make certain points. Okay? So what I'm doing here is that I write down a general equilibrium no home, uh, uh, home market effect model where the domestic demand composition difference across the countries come from the no home state preferences. And I'm going to drop the, uh, this mirror image assumptions. The so more specific idea of what I'm going to do is that there are two countries. Two countries uh, differ 
the only source of differences between the two countries are that, first of all, the population size, as well as the per capita labor endowment. Okay? And that can be you know, interpreted as a difference in the human capital. Okay? And there's a continuum of Dixie Stiglitz more competitive sectors uh, with, with, a, with a trade cost. And then the, sort of, uh, the key innovation is here is this uh, ISO, there's a pr no, there's a different continuum of no, sectors, actually uh, from zero to one, index zero to one. And there's a t uh, consumer has the preferences over this continuum of sectors. Okay. And that preference is, uh, is given by the something called the implicitly additively separable non-homothetic CS. I'll explain that in the next slide, what that is. But this preference is uh, such that, uh, and, uh, and the sectors are indexed in such a way that uh, the, 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 the income elasticity is a sector specific. And furthermore, it's increasing in index. So there's a continuum sector from zero to one. Sector one is the most income elastic sectors. Sector zero is the least income elastic sectors. Okay? And the one I'm going to show is that first of all, the pattern of trades uh, such that the rich countries demand the comp competition of the most skewed towards higher index sectors. And furthermore, when the two countries trade with each other, uh, which is share of the firms and the employment are more disproportionately allocated to the higher index sectors. And the, the result, the rich country become a net export in a high income, high, oh, I'm sorry, high index, uh, high, uh, high income elastic sectors, and the, regardless of the, of the country size. And then what I'm going to show is that there's a, there's a series of comparative statics. Uh, and here's an actually important thing is unlike Krugman, the different demand composition across the country arises endogenously. Okay? So the technology change, that could change the, uh, the distribution of the demand across the sectors. And so for example, that the, when the, the every, every activity's productivity goes up at the uniform rate, or the, when the production costs uh, decline, what happened is that, so actually, so no, let me just go back to this. Uh, so the, the, the predicted pattern of trade is such that there's a continuum of sectors, but there are some cutoff sectors. Okay? And uh, every sector above the cutoff, you know, it's, it's a net, uh, the, the rich country is in surplus. And then below the cutoff, poor countries uh, run the trade surplus. Okay? Of course, overall, the trade is balanced. Okay? And when these things change, whether productivity improves or the, or the trade costs decline, this cutoff move up which means in the middle sectors, it's switched from net surplus from the rich country to the net deficit for the, for, for the rich country. So it's, no, so it's, it's, so it's, uh, uh, so it's no, no, it generated from product cycles. Okay? Now, there are many actually models of the product cycle in international trade, but they usually rely on the, some kind of the technology diffusions. Okay. Here, actually, it's a consequence of the world as a whole getting richer as a result of the productivity improvement or the, or the globalization. Okay. And then I have some welfare implications. And, and, some, and actually, there are another thing that I think is quite interesting is that in this model, actually, which country become richer is actually endogenous. And sometimes, as a result of trade liberalization, that uh, uh, actually the, the, some countries gain more from this, uh, uh, the globalizations, and that sometimes the, the ranking of the country itself could change. Okay? So those are kind of the things that are, are, are generated in this model. Now, so let me explain this. This is the new key innovation here. This implicitly, I'm using this uh, relatively unknown form of the utility functions called the implicitly additive separable um, CS. So let me explain what this is. Actually, it's not that new, it was, it's relatively unknown. It's go back to 1975 econometrica paper by Jura Hanak. Okay? So the, he introduces several notions of, well, distinguishes several notions of additive separabilities. Okay? And when we usually think about additively separable preferences, this is the, what we, we usually think about. Okay? The, according to the Hanak's terminology, this is a direct implicit additivities. Okay? 
What I mean is the direct utility function can be written like this. Okay? So, so here I'm using it for the continuum case of the original zero HANA, which is the finite number of girls. But you know, so the continuum sectors that I'm assuming, so I'm using the continuum, so you can be written as just additive terms of the consumption of the, uh, uh, of the, of the, uh, the uh, goods produced in each sector. Okay? Now, if you want this to be a CS, then it, looks, it has to be looks like this. Okay? And uh, I'm sure you know that under this type of additivities, you know, the CS and homothetics are the equivalent. Homothetivity implies CES, CES implies homothetivity. And that is called Bergson's law. Okay? Now, but it's actually a special case of more general law, so it's called, sometimes called the Pigou's law. So that under the explicit additive separabilities, income elasticity of the particular goods and the price elasticity of the particular goods, those ratio has to be the, the same across all the factors. Okay? So, for example, if it, you want this to be a non homothetic then the, the, this will vary across the sectors. But then, then the price elasticity also has to vary across the sectors and in a proportional way. Okay? Now, um, there are many problems with this. First of all, a lot of people pointed out that this is empirically false. Okay, so you can certainly write down a reduced form system of consumer demand. Okay, so let's say the log of the consumption of various goods is regressed on the log of prices and the log of the spending, household spending, and uh, the additive sum. So you can actually try to write down you know, estimate the, the reduced form way that you know, income elasticity and the price elasticity of the, the each sectors. And Certainly, this though, proportionality is easily rejected. Not only that, often that what you find is the goods, high income elastic goods, tend to be less income el uh, price elastic. So even the sign is wrong. Okay, so that's the problem. But another problem is the more conceptual problem. Suppose we want to understand the difference in the income elasticity across the sectors, but within this framework. If you introduce you know, uh, in, you know, sector-specific income elasticity, you end up you know, introducing a sector-specific price elasticity differences. Okay? So we don't know the which effect we are, we are getting by, you know, <coughs> letting, uh, by introducing a non homothetic series. Okay? There's no way we can disentangle the effect of income elasticity differences from the uh, effects of price elasticity differences. Okay? Of course, one way to get out of this is to just give up the assumption of separabilities, or to just give up the assumption of the representative agents. Okay? But there is an alternative way by adopting a different notion of the additivity, additive separability, introduced by the HANA. So this is, according to HANA, actually direct implicit additivity, which is a you know, ETT function it is additively separable, but it's given in an implicit way. Okay? Now, this gives great flexibilities. And essentially, the price elasticity of this curve is how this function responds to the, the change in the CS. But the income elasticity of this curve is how the, this function responds to you. So, the, so that can be controlled separately. So, for example, you can actually allow these functions, to, uh, utility functions, to be CS. Then it looks like this. Now, the difference between here and here is uh, here the weighting weight are constant. Here the weight is a function. Okay? Of course, the shape of this indifference curve is the same. You know, whenever you estimate, you know, try to calculate the Hicksian demand, you control U, so you fix U. So that once you fix U, the shape of the indifference curve given by this or the given by this is the same. You cannot separate, uh, which, you, know, you cannot tell whether it's given by this or given by this. What the difference between here and here is how this difference, indifference curves are lined up. Okay? And if this responds to U, the way that the, this way responds to U differ across the sectors or the goods, 
then we get a norm of statisticals. So if this object depends on S, now we get no home statistics. And still we have CS. And furthermore, if we can actually index these sectors in such a way that this object is increasing in S, then what that means is this weighting function is log supermodular. Okay? And for those of you who know the work by you know, the uh, Anna Costino or the, going back to even like a Susan AC or you know, Milgram Shannon, the log supermodularity is a greatly simplified comparative static exercise, and that's what I'm, uh, what I'm doing here. On top of that, I'm going to assume that the, this is a power function of u. Okay? And that means that this object depends on s, but not depends on u. Okay? And this is actually consistent with the, sort of a, sort of a, the empirical evidence of the, this, uh, this system of consumer demand. So when they try to estimate this Engels curve and the slope of the Engels curve, sometimes the, what they do is to split the sample between a rich household, among the rich household and the poor household, and see how that the slopes change, depending on whether you're looking at the, among the rich families or the poor family. It turns out that the, the you know, slope turns out to be very uh, stable. Okay? So the elast income elasticity difference across the, uh, the, the goods actually doesn't really depend on, the, on whether the consumer is very rich or the very poor. Okay? And that, so this is certainly consistent with this. And it's not certainly consistent with the alternative like a, a stone Gary preferences. The first of all, stone Gary is explicitly additively separable but it is subject to this problem. On top of that, the Stone-Gary preferences <laughs> have a problem that the non homothetically would disappear as the household income goes up. Because it all you know, depends on the, uh, the, uh, uh, the, the minimum of the level of consumption, uh, sustainable level of the consumption. Okay? So that's basically what I do here. Okay? Uh, I'm going to skip this because I'm running out of time. All right, so let me actually go to the model. So that's, there's a one factor production, the labor, and there are two countries. Uh, I, it can be labeled as one and two, but sometimes I index by J and K. J, when, when we talk about the location of the production. K, when I talk about the location of the consumption. Okay? But the two countries are, have, can be different in two dimensions. First of all, population size and also the per capita labor endowment, which can be interpreted as the human capital or the, the quality of labor force, okay? Now, and, and, and they, labor is supplied by, uh, 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 inelastically uh, with, uh, with, uh, with the wage rate that prevailing in each country. And the main is the household income is of the country J is given by this. And this is a static model, so that's also equal to the expenditures. And this is a total labor supply, okay? And so the, these uh, N and H, and hence L, are the only source of uh, uh, heterogeneity across the two countries, okay? And then this is a, a set of the goods that this country can produce. So first of all, there are continuum sectors that index by S and run from zero to one. And each sector produces a continuum of dif a tradable differentiated goods. And that can be produced in, 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 in either countries. And, but the, this, uh, and, but you know, because they're product differentiated, no, they're, they're disjoint. And, and the set of the goods are produced are determined by this multiple competitive model. So they're determined endogenously through the entry process. Uh, so, the, so, the, uh, yes, so that there's a variety effect. Okay? So this is actually the a key page. <laughs> Um, of, the, of, the, my, of the most important page of my, uh, the slide. So the household preferences are given by the two structures, the two tier structures, okay? So the lower level, so within each sectors, it's just standard Dixie Stiglitz aggregators. I'm sure all of you are familiar with it, okay? So there's no, and so the elastic substitution between is, is, is greater, uh, the different variety is, is, uh, is greater than uh, one. And then those Dixie, the continuum of Dixie's aggregators 
uh, aggregated by upper tier utility function. Okay? And that you can always write in a, like this way, but it's actually given implicitly by, uh, by this form. Okay? So this is what I told you about. So this is, uh, you know, this depends on you. So, and so the weight function on this is, is, you know, depends on you. And, and this is CS. So this is CS, but, uh, but implicitly additive. And the weighting function uh, so, no, satisfies this. Okay? So first of all, that elasticity substitution across the different sectors is the less than the elasticity substitution across the bar within the factors. Okay? Um, and then, actually, in order for, for, to uh, ensure the unique equilibrium and, and uh, no, no, to, to have a sort of nice comparative static, I need to actually ensure that you know, this pro utility function satisfies the global monotonicity and the quadratic cavity, and that required me to impose this restriction. Okay. Now, without loss of the general, no, uh, by the way, the key feature here is that the way the weighting function responds to you depends on the sector. So this is a, a function of sector. Uh, uh, this depends on S. Okay. Now, I can certainly uh, without loss of generality, I can normalize these uh, things, so this will be add up to one. Okay? Now, suppose if this is all equal to one, then this becomes a standard homothetic CES. If this is all equals to the constant uh, is equal to one, then you can factor this out on this side and rearrange it, and you get a standard homothetic CES. But if this is non homothetic, then the sectors are indexed, and, and uh, then it's non homothetic. If this is, uh, this is not equal to 1, then it's non homothetic. And furthermore, if I index sectors so this is the monotony increasing in S, then this weighting function is log super modular in S and U. Okay? Now, there's actually the one property of log super modularity I keep using repeatedly in these papers. So I summarize it in, in a lemma. So suppose that you have some value function, of positive value function, uh, defined of uh, the interval on one, and with some parameter, shift parameter x. Okay. Uh, now, because this is a positive value function, you can always normalize it in a way to, to create that this is going to be the density function of uh, this interval, and this is a cumulative functions of uh, that interval. And if this positive value function is log super modular in this S and X, then this increasing X will put more weight on a higher S in the sense that this density function satisfies the monotone likelihood ratio. And also in, ter uh, in terms of the first order stochastic dominance. Okay? So when I apply this lemma to this particular uh, case, then what it says is that households whose U is higher would relatively put more weight on higher index goods, both in the sense of monotone likelihood ratio as well as the first order stochastic dominance. Okay? Now, so that's the, the assumption I make, okay? And so the next step is to solve for the household maximizations. Uh, so this is like it's no two-tier structure, so it's just a two-stage budgeting problem. The lower stage is just a standard Dix's cigarette uh, optimization. Um, so you know, it's assuming, that suppose that you decide to allocate this amount of expenditure to the particular factors, then the question is how to allocate across the different varieties. This problem is well known. Uh, so the, what I want to say is that now that uh, so you get some op maximized value of this, uh, the Dixie-Stiglitz aggregators, and, and that satisfies this, where that this is a uh, uh, standard Dixie-Stiglitz price indices. And, and yeah, so that this, this proper you, you guys know very well. And, and yes? Uh, how is the measure of the omegas important? Can they all be normalized to the same thing? Or is it well, that's not, that's, yeah, that's, that, yeah, that change will be the central comparative static. Okay. Yes. Okay. Okay. 
Now, now the sort of now, no, well, first you, now the you, after you solve the, the, this lower uh, level maximization problem, you put it into the upper level and consider the allocation across the different sectors. So now that you choose your spending across the sectors, given your total expenditures, okay, and you maximize the utilities. Okay? The only non-conventional thing that's about this is the utility function is given implicitly. So instead of putting a utility function in a maximization, maximized objective function, it's enter in, in a constraint. Okay? But otherwise, this is just a standard maximization problem. You know? just the objection, objective function is linear in U, and it's convex. Uh, so so you know, this is just a standard convex maximization problem. So the first order condition actually is enough to guarantee the, the global optimum. Now, if you can, s and it turns out that the solution is easy, to, you know, the, it's, it's useful to write it this way. Okay? So what is the expenditure share of the each sectors? Okay? How much, what fraction of the expenditure are you going to allocate to the each sectors? And, and that looks like this. Okay? Where the U is now, instead of have up, now the upper tilde is now removed. So this is the maximized value of the U. And that is, I'm sure, so you have to make sure that you have to uh, satisfy this, uh, uh, the budget constraint. And that condition can be written this way. Okay? So, so the first thing, yes? K is the number of? K is a location of the household. Okay. K is a location of the household. Okay, so this K can be country one, country two. So th this is just the index of the country where they happen to live in. Okay, because uh, trade cost, uh, the, you know, the price they face actually depends on where they happen to be uh, living. So I have to you know, index it. So K is uh, household in country K's and how they allocate their expenditures across the sectors. Okay. And that depends on the price index of the, the each sectors, okay? And, 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 and of course, it no, depends on the, the expendit uh, expenditure level. That determines how, 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 what level of the utility they could achieve. And by the what level of the utility they could achieve actually affect the way they actually spend across the different goods because of normal statistics, okay? Another way of saying this is no. That this is, another way of looking at this is that you can think of this as an indirect utility function. But here, the actual indirect utility function is given implicitly. Okay? But, it would, no, but, that group, but that this property that I actually ensures that this is actually increasing in expenditures. Okay? So the more you can spend, you'll be happier. Okay? And so that the, so the, the richer household that we could spend more can achieve the, to, to the higher uh, utilities, and that will change their uh, spending patterns. Okay? And furthermore, if you look at this, how does these things respond to uh, the U if you compare the two sectors? Okay? It, it looks like this. Okay? So the higher index sectors that I assume that this is increasing in the index, so higher index sectors, uh, so you know, if, if the household become um, happier, they allocate more uh, uh, expenditures to the higher index sectors. And, and, and so, this is, so this means that the higher index sector is, is a high income elastic, uh, has a higher income elasticity. On top of that, the differences are constant across the different levels of per capita income. Okay? That comes from the fact that this is uh, uh, that uh, power, no, the weighting function, the power function of you. Okay? But anyway, that this expenditure share has this form. And remember, this is a positive value function, and but normalized so that this would be add up to one. And this actually is log supermodular in S and U. But that means from that same lemma that higher consumer with a higher expenditure and hence can achieve a higher utility will spend more for the higher index. Okay. Now the rest of the model is that 
Uh, I will go to the 11.30, right? Yeah, OK. So the rest of the model, I deliberately kept the same with the Krugman 1980. Okay? So there's the, the, the trade cost, the iceberg trade cost, so that as you ship abroad, your product abroad, uh, the fraction would disappear. And one, only the one over top fraction of the export actually survived the shipping. What that means that your marginal cost would go up by the factor of tau by, by, when you try to sell to abroad, that increases the price by the factor of tau, but that, that reduces the demand by the factor of tau minus sigma, which is the elasticity of uh, the substitution of the, the each varieties. And so that would reduce, have the effect of reducing the, uh, the revenue from the, from the export uh, to the fraction that, that, that is given by tau. Okay? But otherwise, it's quite a standard um, competitive model of trade, so that the demand for each variety is, is just a constant F3 of demand with some sh aggregate sh demand shifters. But the aggregate demand shifter actually come from uh, has, a, has a two sources. So if you are producing in country J, some come from the domestic demand, some come from the export demand. But the export demand has to be weighted by this tau, of sort of the role, because of the, uh, the trade cost shrinks the revenues. What's different here from the standard trade model is that this demand shifter in each market is now a function of the, the level of the utility that the, the, the consumer in each market actually can achieve. Okay? So that will en endogenize this, uh, the aggregate demand shifters. Okay? But, the rest, but otherwise, it's a standard CS demand curve. So it's the standard Dixie Street property hold. So the constant markup, and that generates some profit. But you know, there's an entry cost, and so that's uh, so the, the, the firm would enter with a new variety. As long as they can cover the fixed cost, the profit would cover enough to cover, they can earn the profit, enough profit to cover the fixed cost of entry. But of course, in equilibrium, that cost of entry has to be exactly equal to the, the gross profit they can earn, so that actually there will be a net zero profit condition that pin down the variety, how many varieties are produced in, this, in each sector in each country. And then there's the, the labor market equilibrium conditions. And, and so the, this is actually the share of, in the country J, of the employment. And, and also here, that's it, also the value added uh, of the each sector in the, each country. Okay? So that's the potential of the model. Now, all I need to do is to just solve it. Okay? Now, I'm not going through, the, of course, the derivation. I will just tell you what the, uh, the, the solution looks like. The first, let's consider the case of the autarky. So that the two countries, they don't trade with at all. Okay? And then it turns out this is going to be the level of the utility, and this is going to be the distribution of the funds, and the employment, and, and the market size across the sectors. Now, one thing I want to point out here is that when you usually write down and solve the general equilibrium model, what you first do is you solve for the equilibrium quantities. You solve for the equilibrium prices, you solve for the equilibrium production, you solve for the equilibrium consumption, and then you put, uh, that's the part of the positive analysis. And then you put those things back into the utility functions to find out what the welfare is going to be. So there's a two-step procedure. First, you do the positive analysis, and then you do the normative analysis. Here, we cannot do that because of the functions are implicitly defined, the utility functions implicitly defined. So how the consumer behave depends on how happy they are. Okay? And, and then, so you have to assume that, you, know, you have to figure out you know, what the level of the utility that the consumer gets. And then you derive the consumer demand, and you solve for it, and you put it back into the utility function and see that, in fact, that's the same as the utility you started with. So there's a, there's non trivial fixed point problem you have to solve. But it turned out that this here that's actually quite feasible. So the, but anyway, the point I wanted to make is that no, here we, you, we cannot separate the po positive and normative analysis. We have to do it at the same time. We have to solve them simultaneously. 
But nice thing that's about this is that the level of the utility that they can achieve is summarized by the, some single index. Okay? And that index is given by this. Okay? So here's the no autarky case, so that the K is both the location of the consumption and the location of the production. Okay? And obviously, if the, each household has a higher level endowment, it, it, oh, by the way, so this function is increasing in U, increasing function, and that, is, that function itself is defined implicitly like this. Okay? Uh, so the, so but the, the, the welfare level is a function of this, uh, increasing function of this index, and that index is increasing in the per capita labor endowment. So obviously, the more labor endowment you have, you have more higher income, and so, so, so you'll be happier. Okay? In addition, if you have us to live in a bigger country, you'll, you'll be happier. And, and that's because of this you know, more of the competitive model, like this, that the implicit aggregate increasing return. So there's a fixed cost of adding a variety. Uh, uh, and, and, and you know, if you live in a, you know, in a country with a large number of population, you can share those fixed costs of adding variety with, with other people, and that, is, that should generate the aggregate increasing returns. Uh, but the one thing I want to point out is this. So, so what that means is even though that you might be compared to other country, you might have a higher human capital, but if you happen to live in a very small country, your welfare may be lower. Okay? So even though that the every the country, the, the, the labor in the country is very highly educated and a very productive the labor force, the, that country may actually have a lower welfare compared to the other country whose labor force are not educated, mm -hmm. but it's a big country. Okay? Just because you cannot take advantage, if you live in a small country, you cannot take advantage of the, of the scale, economies of scale. Okay? But anyway, so the, in Autarky, it turns out that the distribution of the employment market size as uh, well the distribution of farms, uh, the all across the sectors uh, can be all written this way. Okay? The first of all, that's so that the distribution of the labor allocation is just a proportional to the market size in autarky. Okay? And, and that distribution can be written this way. Again, it's like before. So, and uh, this function is now log supermodular in S and this single index. Okay? So the country which has a higher index of this, which means that the country whose welfare level is higher, will put more weight on the, on the higher index factors. Okay? Uh, actually, I'm going to skip this. Okay? So now what happened is, you know, when they started trading with each other? The first thing I need to solve for the relative to wage rate between the two countries. Okay? And it turns out here, it's turned out to be quite simple. It looks like this. So, so here's the relative uh, the ratio of the two countries in the measuring the total labor supply, and here the relative wage rate. Okay. Now, so because of this in, uh, aggregate increasing return that I mentioned earlier, that the bigger country has a higher wage rate. Okay. And just because the smaller countries uh, have, have, uh, can take a less advantage of the disadvantage of being small. Okay? But how, the, how, how but that the degree of disadvantage the small country, smaller country has experienced actually depends on the trade cost. Okay? So as the trade costs fall and the so row goes up, so that's a globalization actually shifts this graph uh, uh, like this, as indicated by the green arrow. Okay? What that mean is that as globalization actually reduces the disadvantage of smaller countries and, and, and also the reduces the, the factor price differences. Okay? Now, so after we you know, just sort of, you know, get this uh, the, you know, relative wage rate uh, formula, then we put it back into the, uh, and then so I solve it, and it turns out that the welfare level of the two countries and the market size distribution of the, of the, uh, 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 the two countries can be written this way. Okay? The nice thing about this is still uh, 
increasing function, and, uh, it's increasing in the same utility, fu uh, same function, uh, function but uh, with uh, some index. And, and it's all summarized by the index. But all you need to do is to, to, to look at the effects of trade, you have to just keep track of this index. Okay? The first thing you can know, so you can point out that uh, both countries actually gain from trade okay, compared to the autarky. And, and, the, and the market size distribution actually depends on how the level of the utility that each country can achieve. Okay. And, but with the same formula, then again, this is actually st uh, again still log supermodular in S and uh, this, uh, the index. So from that, you can show that suppose that the two countries are such that, say the second country can achieve, consumers in the second country can achieve higher welfare than the, the countries, the consumers in the first country. Then this ratio is decreasing in S, which means that the market size distribution of the richer countries are more skewed toward the higher index sectors, uh, both in terms of the monotone likelihood ratio and the first order stochastic dominance. Okay? And then we can solve for the distribution of the funds or the employment distribution across the sectors. And here we get this whole market effect. Okay? So that if the poor countries put relatively more, have, uh, have relatively spend more in some sectors, that sector uh, attract disproportionately more uh, employment and firms in the sectors in the poor country and disproportionately less in, in the richer countries. Okay? And then you calculate the sectoral trade balance, then it turns out the, the sign of the sector to the balance in each sector is just given by this. Okay? Now, and uh, so actually, no, let me just give you this. Okay? So that's, so imagine that second country is richer than the, no, 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 than, uh, than the first countries. And then this market size ratio between the two <coughs> countries are decreasing. Okay? Because the second country relatively spend more on the higher index good. First, you know, poor countries spend relatively more spend on the, uh, the lower index good, and then that's declined, and, and it's actually it's cut one uh, somewhere in the middle, and then that show up as a, in a magnified way that you know, distort the uh, other trade. When the, when the, there's no trade, the distribution of firms and employment across the, uh, the how they are you know, uh, uh, across the sectors how they are differ across the two countries is actually the same with this if it is if it is in our talking. But as uh, they stated uh, the, the, the trade costs they started trading it will be tilted in this way. And so the disproportionately more uh, workers are employed in lower index sectors in the poor countries. And so the poor countries start net ex become a net exporter in the lower index sectors and the rich countries uh, become a net exporter in 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 in, 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 in in a higher index sectors, okay? Um, actually, given the time, actually, the, which country become richer, actually, they're the endogenous things, and actually, um, unfortunately, I, I don't have time to go through this. But nice thing about this is that I can do a sort of comparative static, okay? So that I'll just show you, just tell, tell you one comparative static. So suppose that everywhere the labor productivity goes up uniformly in all sectors in both countries. And then it turns out that the, this downward sloping graph would shift to the right so that the cutoff that separate the, the, uh, net ex the trade patterns between the, across the sectors will move up. As a result, these sectors, before the productivity improvement, it was a net surplus for the rich countries. Now it become the net deficit of the rich countries. Okay? So it looks like this is a, uh, the, the product cycle. And the intuition here is quite simple. You know, why does the whole become more productive? And that means that everybody spend their sh uh, uh, shift their spending towards a higher index good. But that those are the sectors, the rich country have the competitive advantage. Okay? But overall trade partner account has to remain zero. What that means is the sector uh, balance of 
in each sector has to deteriorate for the, for the rich country. As a result, the, the, these in the middle, some sectors switch from, 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 uh, from the positive for the rich country to the negative for the rich countries. Okay? And there are uh, all other sort of comparative static exercise that uh, one could do, and I have uh, plenty of other pages, but, but uh, given that I've run out of time, uh, I'm, I'm, I actually am going to stop here. That's it. Would that mean that in rich countries, uh, trade uh, grows through the intensive margin and poor countries through the extensive margin? No, because you have the, the poor countries no? uh -huh. exporting more things, uh -huh. and the rich countries exporting more of the high elasticity goods. No? Yes. So, so do you have this, no? Extensive margin for the poor countries, intensive margin for the rich countries? Uh, but you know, remember that you know that the cons you know, ex consumer expenditures also change, right? So that you know, just the way the way change. Okay, so that you know, now the very you know, before the, the improvement, you know, the, the, a lot of spending was. The consumer spend a lot on a, on a lower index goods, but that now they don't spend much. Most of the spending are now occurring on this <coughs> side. Okay. And 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 uh, the readout that the, just the weight is shifting towards the uh, index goods. So uh, it's mm -hmm. not. It, 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 I can't really. I don't think I can say into the intensive versus extensive. Yeah. Another question. What? Um, does this setup have any implications for global convergence? Or yeah, so that's the, the things that I actually want, I, I wanted to say and that I, I really didn't, I couldn't say. So the, so the one interesting possibility is that, so suppose the two countries, you know, for example, in, in, uh, in this experiment, okay, what happens to the, the welfare gap between the two countries? Okay. Now, if it, it turns out if the sectors, so actually that's the, the, this thing, okay? If the sector produces substitute, then as a result of this process, actually welfare gap between the rich and poor countries actually widen. But if it's complement, the poor country will catch up. So it's, it's narrow the gap, okay? Uh, and, uh, Similar effect happen when you reduce the trade cost, in particular when the tr uh, two countries are equal in size in the total labor supply. Okay. Then actually the comparative study is totally isomorphic to this experiment, so the same statement can be made. But when the two countries are unequal in size, there's something interesting happen. Sometimes poor country may end up become richer as a result of globalization. And the reason is that precisely because of the this terms of trade movement uh, due to the globalization. Okay, so in this globalized world, maybe the country like Switzerland has a disadvantage. Okay. But suppose that you know, Switzerland has a higher per capita the labor endowment compared to the rest of the world, and as a result of the globalization, this advantage of being small become smaller. After all, you now start selling everywhere in the world at a very cheap cost. Okay. And as a result, this disadvantage of being small become negligible. And the result, and but the, the, given that Switzerland had a higher per capita labor endowment, it ended up being emerged as a richer than the rest of the world. So that actually the leapfrogging can occur in this model. So then actually this model has a quite a rich implication uh, in terms of you know, this uh, relative differences across the countries.